Um, it's Sunday, April the 5th. And um, don't forget, you got to take your tests this um, Monday if, at 9.30 a.m. for the Monday 9.30 a.m. students. Or in Campbell County, it would be Monday at 2 p.m. You got to take the test then. Or Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. I hope that you're all staying safe and under this unusual situation. Um, as far as the grades go, um, once I get them back from Momentum, I, I'm going to have to curve them, and then I'll get those grades to you. Um, but we do have some material we need to cover this week, and it will be we're going to finish off Chapter 11, and we're going to get into Chapter 12. So, where did we leave off last time? Well, we left off last time right about here. Here is an image showing you... Oh, by the way, um, summer classes, before I get started, summer classes, um, there's only one class. It's physical geology. It starts June the 1st, and it goes for seven weeks. Um, we still have a few seats left if you want to get into that class. Uh, we might have to teach it online. I don't. No one knows with this coronavirus situation. And if it is online, I'll make sure that uh, it's the best class possible. And if it's in person, that'd be even better. Hopefully, it'll be over by then. The only time will tell. So, <clears throat> where did we leave off? We left off at chapter eleven, and all of the material for the final exam. It uh, is going to start off right here with this picture from chapter 11. Um, the f so the, all this material that you're starting right here is going to be on the final exam. This shows you the Mississippi and paleogeography of North America. And paleo means ancient, so ancient, the ancient geography of North America. We've looked at a lot of these different maps. And let's take a good close look at this one for the Mississippian. So we're done with the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. And now we're into the Mississippian period of the Paleozoic era. Here you can see a huge, large mountain range right here on the eastern seaboard. And then a sandy beach to the west. This, this is what North America looked like back during the Mississippi. There was a large island with mountains and then a sandy beach to the east. Where did the sand come from? It came from the erosion of these mountains. You might recall that almost all of the mountain building activity of the Paleozoic occurred on our east coast, not on our west coast, except for that little one here. But Nine, almost 95% of the mountain building occurred because there, on the East Coast because there was a subduction zone along our East Coast and that produced mountain ranges. We did have a little small mountain range out west called the Antler Highlands. But you really want to remember for the next test, the Williston Basin. W-I-L-L-I-S-T-O-N. This is the Williston Basin up in Canada. And it's an important source of construction materials um, for Home Depot, Lowe's, and all of the big uh, home improvement stores because uh, drywall is made of gypsum, and a lot of it's mined here in the Williston Basin up in Canada. Here you have the reefs around the Williston Basin, just as you had for the Michigan Basin that was formed during the Silurian. We talked about how those formed earlier on. When we get to Pennsylvania time, this is what North America looked like. So after the Mississippian period, you go to the Pennsylvania period. A few important things you want to remember. One real important thing, don't forget this, 
is that the Appalachian Mountains formed 290 million years ago during the Pennsylvanian period. So I hope that you remember this even when this class is over. If somebody were to ask you, if your kids were to ask you, for example, how old are the Appalachian Mountains? They are 290 million years old. Form from subduction along our east coast. These green areas here in this map show you coal swamps. So most of the world's coal, Tennessee coal, Kentucky coal, West Virginia coal, it's formed during the Pennsylvanian period when we had coal swamps in these areas in green. How does coal form? Well, it forms in swamps. Like the swamps off of the Mississippi River Delta right now. Coal was made from plants that have died in wetlands. And as the vegetation gets buried, it forms peat, then lignite, and then bituminous coal. And a term you want to get familiar with is cyclothem deposition. What is cyclothem deposition? Well, coal miners know what cyclothem deposition is. I have um, some friends up in Scott County who own some coal mines, and they know what cyclothem deposition is. What happens is, there's a pattern that repeats itself over and over again. So you see the same rocks over and over again. And, and these rocks are, are represented by this stratigraphic column over here. What we have here is quite interesting. You have uh, non-marine shales and sandstones deposited. So uh, basically, uh, this was above sea level. And finally, uh, you have coal on top of these non-marine sedimentary rocks. Sea level rises and kills the coal swamps. And then we have all of these marine rocks deposited. Then the whole pattern repeats itself again, where you have non-marine rocks, sea level rises, kills the coal swamp, and then marine rocks are deposited on top. So if you own um, a coal mine, you know that you're going to see this pattern over and over again. You're going to know how deep you're going to need to mine to get to the next coal bed. It's a repeating pattern. And these repeating patterns are called cyclothems. Now, this is the paleogeography of North America during the Permian time. Permian is the last period of the Paleozoic. And here you can see that the Appalachian Mountains have continued to grow. Now the Appalachian Mountains are not this big anymore. They've eroded away. All of this part has eroded away. All of this part has eroded away. And this is what's left today. But during Permian times, the Appalachian Mountains stood a lot taller than they do today maybe two to three times taller. And over the last 250 million years, much of the Appalachians have eroded away. The, this part is all gone here. This part down south is all gone. The Appalachians don't extend into Florida. So, um, and also they're not as tall as they used to be because they've been eroded away over the years. We also have during the Permian period, this very important area and it's called the Permian Basin. The Permian Basin is very important. You can see the reefs again associated with these evaporites. Well these reef bearing rocks, don't forget, are excellent places to find petroleum, oil. Traditionally most of our petroleum has been 
drilled from East Texas and Oklahoma, where you have these reefs, these Permian reefs, lot, lots of oil in that Permian basin from um, what happened back during the Permian. These green areas here are phosphates used to make laundry detergent. So this is an important ore deposit here that formed all the way up into Canada, into Montana. So for the Permian, what you want to remember is the Appalachian Mountains are there, which formed during the Pennsylvanian, but they're still tall and they're long. They extend quite a distance. We have the Permian Basin during the Permian, and then we have these phosphate deposits. Don't forget the Permian Basin is an important source of petroleum for the United States. And there's a little bit that goes into Canada, Mexico, too, which the Mexicans drill into through their oil co company, which is uh, Pemex, P-E-M-E-X, -E -E the Mexican National Oil Company. So we have lots of reef deposits, as we talked about before, and a lot of them hold oil. Reef deposits are excellent places to look for oil. And natural gas. Don't forget most of the world's coal was formed during the what period? The Pennsylvanian period. 98% of the US coal was bituminous coal that we burn. This uh, lignite in yellow we're not allowed to burn it. This uh, sub bituminous coal we're not allowed to burn it. Why? Because we have a Clean Air Act that protects uh, our environment, for protect our air supply. Um, basically these these sources in green and yellow are too polluting. And we got a little bit of anthracite coal, metamorphic coal, which is the cleanest burning coal, metamorphic rock. Anthracite coal is metamorphic. That's the best we have, but it only represents 1% of the coal in the United States. So the coal that we can actually can burn to make electricity is bituminous coal formed during the Pennsylvanian period. And we can find it using the cyclothems. That's all you need to know for chapter number 11. Now we're going to get into something really interesting, which is chapter number 12. Chapter 12. Paleozoic life history invertebrates. Once again, the Paleozoic era is 542 million years ago to 245 million years ago. Invertebrates are creatures without backbones. All kinds of different creatures. You, you studied some of them in lab. <clears throat> Phylum Cynidria. Phylum Mollusca. Phylum Echinodermata. Phylum Arthropoda. Um, and a lot of Brachiopoda. Let's take a look at this chart here. Here's your major invertebrate groups. You need to know these. And this is straight out of your book. Let's go over them one at a time. Phylum Protozoa. So far, you haven't seen any protozoa fossils in the lab. I'm going to show you some. But these are single-celled organisms that make their tiny little shells in water and these tiny shells are called tests. T-E-S-T-S. -T -S, like you're taking a test. Let's take a look at the tests of some of these organisms that belong to protozoa. Here's a common one. Foraminifera. These are the little tests of these foraminifera, which belong to phylum protozoa. These are, all protozoans are planktonic. They float. They don't swim and they're not on the ocean bottom. Let me show you some more of these single-celled creatures. Another type of protozoa is radiolarians. It's quite beautiful if you look at, these are, these have spikes on them. Maybe they're for protection. But, um, these are called radiolarians. Bottom line, phylum protozoa are your single-celled planktonic fossils. 
organisms. Phylum periphera, we talked about that before. Those are the benthic creatures that are, what are they called call in real life? Do you remember? They're called sponges. And you need to be able to identify those. Next one, so we're, we talked about that earlier. I'm not going to talk about it again. But next we're going to talk about phylum Archaeocyatha. We haven't talked about these guys yet, so let's talk about them. Arche, and I'm going to spell for you here. Arche, Archaeocyatha. And these are creatures you probably, I'm pretty sure you've never heard about them before, but this is what they look like. Uh, on the average, they'd be about six feet tall. They lived on the bottom of the ocean, so they are benthic. And these are index fossils for the Cambrian period. In other words, if you find these inside of rocks, you know that those rocks are Cambrian in age. They lived on the bottom of the ocean during the Cambrian, and they made up the reefs of the Cambrian. Nowadays, reefs are made up of corals, phylum cynidria. But back during the Cambrian, the reefs were made of these strange-looking creatures called um, archaeocyathids in English, or phylum archaeocyatha in Latin. Notice that they have a whole bunch of these chambers on the top, and these chambers surround a central chamber in the middle. They have lots of little holes in the side of their body. So they filtered the water out. And they are the main reef-building organisms of the Cambrian period. This is what they look like, ladies and gentlemen. Arche uh, phylum Archaeocyatha. Next one is Phylum Cynidria. We talked about that in an earlier video. Those are your corals. Most of y'all got those right in lab, but some of you didn't. Um, and... I don't know why people didn't get it, but let me show you the one that we looked at in lab. We saw something that looked like this in lab, and people got it wrong, but most of you got it right. And this is a benthic creature. This is a t one type of coral, but there is a variety of different types of corals. So... Um, if you're not sure if the fossil is a coral, what you need to do is you need to look in your lab manual real careful when you're answering the questions for lab. There's all kinds of different corals. They all have little chambers in them to filter the water. Some of them live in colonies and some of them are solitary. Here you can see some different types of phylum cynidria. Phylum Bryozoa. We haven't looked at those yet, but you'll probably get one of those in lab next week. And let's take a look at what these things are. Phylum Bryozoa. This is straight out of your lab mail. These are what Bryozoa look like. They kind of look like little twigs or fat little uh, rice krispies or um, these kind of look like drill bits, but they're about, oh, anywhere from three quarters of an inch to one and a half inches long on the average. They're benthic organisms. They filter the water. So look, be out and look out for these benthic creatures, Bra phylum bryozoa, phylum brachiopoda. I need to mention that real quick because most of you all got the, these right. Um, the fossils you looked at last week were all from the Paleozoic era. Most of you wrote that it got the answer right. Some of you didn't give an answer for that. So you got to read through all the instructions real careful. Make sure you don't miss things. But um, don't confuse these creatures with phylum mollusca, class bivalvia. Uh, some of you all got identified brachiopods as bivalves. And I mentioned before some of the clues you can, we have, uh, like this one here is a brachiopod. All of these creatures here are brachiopods. 
and Barker pods have a little beak at the hinge line where the two shells meet. There's a little beak. Usually one shell is bigger than the other. Another thing is brachiopods are dominate during at the bottom of the sea floor during much of the Paleozoic. Bivalves are usually found in Mesozoic and Cenozoic rocks. Thing and bivalves are oysters, clams, mussels, scallops, creatures with two shells, but each shell is the same size and there's no beak like there is for a brachiopod. So if it's got two shells, it's either a brachiopod or bivalve. Look for that little beak. Look for one shell being bigger than the other. We talked about phylum mollusca. That one's real important. Class gastropoda. Most of you got those right, but a few didn't. The, those are snail shells. Snails. and Their shells are preserved. Class bivalvia. There were none. Uh, there were no bivalves in last week's lab, but they're coming up, and, they, and so look out for those. Class Cephalopoda. These are things related to octopus and squid. They're nectonic organisms. Phylum Annelida. You need to know what that means. Phylum Annelida. Those are worms. We'll talk a little bit about worms, but. We don't have too many fossils of worms because they don't have hard body parts. Phylum Arthropoda, of which there are class Trilobota, class Crustacea, and class Insecta. Take a good look, close look at each of those types of fossils. Do a Google search and see what they look like. Phylum Echinodermata, your echinoderms, with five-fold symmetry. They have things in fives. Class Blastoidea, class Crinoidea, class... Echinoidea and class Asteroidea. We talked about that in an earlier video. Now this one we haven't talked about yet. Phylum Hemicordata and class Graptolithina. Well, let's take a look at those. Uh, Phylum Hemicordata, class Graptolithina. Uh, These are in English are called Graptolites. And you might get some of these in a later lab. They look like little razor blades or saw blades. These belong to Phylum Hemicordata, class Graptolithina, and these things are called Graptolites. Up until the 1970s, we didn't know what these things were. But now we, we, we've recently found the entire creature, and this is what it looked like. This soft body tissue is rarely preserved. Usually you just get these things, the saw blade things. These are planktonic creatures. They floated in the water. And these are uh, razor blade things that atta are attached to the arms and would allow for it to capture its prey and kill it with, this sh with these sharp blades. It will also make it harder to eat this thing. So it's a protective mechanism. This is phylum Hemicordata class Graptolithinia. First thing we're going to talk about that you really, uh, that's very interesting, it are, is the Burgess Shale. And there's a spelling for you of it for you. The Burgess Shale. First discovered in British Columbia, Canada the province of British Columbia in Canada, back in 1909. And it has some of the most complete, uh, it's the most complete record of early Cambrian life. And so it's very important. Let me show you some organisms uh, that belong to the, don't forget the Burgess Shale from the Cambrian. First thing I'm going to show you you're going to watch a little six-minute film on the Burgess Shale, and then we'll talk about it. So let's watch this film together.
Over 500 million years ago, fantastic creatures sprang into being as though from nowhere. In geologic time, these animals appeared in the blink of an eye. For the evolution of life on our world, it was a singular, defining moment. Des Collins has dedicated his career to the pursuit of these ancient creatures. His quest carries him from the highest mountains to the most desolate deserts. But the challenge for Collins isn't just staying fit. As a paleontologist, he wants to look back in time. All the way back to more than 500 million years ago. By peering into the darkest recesses of animal history, Collins hopes to shed light on what has long remained a mystery. At Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum, Collins works with a vast repository of fragments from the ancient past. Fragments that reveal a world unknown until recently. Now we have a much better one over here. There's that, uh, the, the claw, the large predator. Oh. It shows up much better. Yeah, that's These the, fossils uh, from high in the Canadian Rockies form pieces in a puzzle that tell the story of early life on Earth. Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. Okay, good. good. The locality I work with is what's called the Burgess Shale. It's, it's a very famous locality uh, known since it was first discovered about 1909. The numbers of fossils are in the tens of, of thousands. The first person that, that collected the famous locality out west, uh, in Western Canada, around the turn of the century, he collected some like 65,000 specimens in five seasons. Few fossils reveal an entire animal, so scientists must try to recreate ancient creatures piece by piece. You just never know what you're going to find. The excitement is finding something completely different. And you say, gee whiz, look at that. I've, you know, I've never seen anything like that. But perhaps even more exciting, at least more exciting to me, is finding something that I'm looking for. I know I have some pieces of something, so like a piece of a puzzle. So I, I know there's an animal out there which has this particular structure or looks a certain way. I want to find the animal all put together. Uh, but I, I remember those moments vividly when you get something, and it's never quite what you expect. But it's sort of at the last piece of the puzzle. So this shows you the, the, the claws, which are... Uh... We track it again. It I'm often takes size. years and several false starts to piece a single creature together from various fossils. It's a tricky process of trial and error, as Collins found with a predator called Anomalocaris. Here you can see the eyes on stalk, you can see the, the tail, six parts of the, of the tail here. Now, Anomalocaris was first described over 100 years ago in 1887. Uh, the original novel of Karras was based upon this particular claw. It looked like a shrimp body. It always seemed to lack a head, but it had what appeared to be legs on it. While some mistook a claw for an ancient shrimp, others were equally misled. Because of its circular markings, they labeled this specimen an extinct jellyfish. When further evidence came to light, both theories were shown to be wildly off base. What some had considered separate animals proved to be two parts of a single creature, Anomalocaris. What we thought were the body of a shrimp was actually claws, and what was thought to be a jellyfish was actually the, the jaws of this much, much stranger animal. It took over 100 years to work out what this animal looked like from the first piece that we had. And all those scientists who worked with this stuff for 100 years, they all had it wrong. So, of course, that makes me very nervous that, that uh, when I'm working with this stuff, particularly if I have something which seems to be a piece of something, since I cannot relate it to something that's alive today, when I try to put it together, the chances are I'm going to be wrong. And then we've since collected a complete uh, specimen of Anomalocaris. The, uh, the claws coming here. The jaws don't show because you're looking under, on, the, on the underside of this. But you can see the whole animal here with swimming flaps and this very distinctive tail uh, at the bases. 
So we now have a pretty good idea. We've got the tail, we've got the head of what Anomaly Caris looks like. And here we have a, a nice model uh, of the whole animal. This is the major predator from the, uh, from the main Burgess Shale site. There is the, is the jellyfish jaws. Well, obviously, it's not a jellyfish. These are the, the shrimp body, which are the claws. And if you look at that, compared to the actual claw we have here, this is, this is, not, this is life size. So these things got as big as this. And we even have claws which are twice this size. So it's conceivable that Anomaly Caris got to up to a, uh, three or four feet in, uh, in length. So this was a major predator compared to all the other animals of that particular time. Okay, I hope you liked that video. Um, Anomalocaris. That's one of the um, fossils found in the Birds of Shale. Let me show you another fossil from the Birds of Shale. It's this strange creature here. And when the when uh, Dr. Uh, Wildcott in 1909 first found this, he didn't know what he was looking at. It's such a strange looking creature. You can see there's its head and it has originally he thought that these were its legs but then we found out that these were its legs and it had spikes on it. It had 13 legs. It had a head but no eyes on it. And such since it's such a strange looking organism and there's nothing like it today um, he named this creature Hallucigenia because he thought he was hallucinating when he saw this fossil. So don't forget, Anomalocaris, Hallucigenia, are two of the uh, fossils we talked about for the Burgess Shale from the Cambrian period. There are lots of other ones, too. Um, so, next thing we want to talk about is the Cambrian Explosion. The Cambrian Explosion is something that is very important to remember in historical geology. The Cambrian period of the Paleozoic era began 542 million years ago. 542 million years ago, the Proterozoic Eon ended, and the Phanerozoic Eon began. And the Paleozoic era and the Cambrian period began. When you... When you, uh, geologists have always been confused by something, uh, paleontologists as well, and that is, if you look at rocks, uh, there seems to be an invisible boundary at 542 million years ago. So that rocks that are older than 542 million years old contain very few fossils. One has to search far and wide to find fossils. We talked about some of the fossils, the stromatolites, the acrotarchs, and other tiny little creatures, and then finally the Edicarin fauna. But if you find fossils in rocks that are older than 542 million years old, you could become famous. It's very hard to find fossils in rocks that are older than 542 million years old. As soon as you cross that line and get into sedimentary rocks that are younger than 542 million years old, the rocks are filled with fossils. There appears to have been a thousandfold increase in the number of fossils in rocks as soon as you hit that 542 million year mark. People refer to this as the Cambrian Explosion. Now, what actually happened 542 million years ago? Was there an explosion of life on planet Earth? Did we go from a world with very few living things to a large number of things. The, the newest data indicates that it's not that simple. Let me show you why. When you look at um, rocks that are 542 million years old, what happens, what you notice is, is something very important in the fossil record, which is organisms started to develop shells. Invertebrates started to develop shells. Think about it. Now, when something, when a living thing dies and it has a shell, isn't it a lot more likely to get preserved in the rock record? 
Yes. Because soft body tissue decays. And so what we're really seeing in the rocks is not an explosion of life 542 million years ago, but a, an explosion in the preservability of organisms due to them developing hard body parts starting about 542 million years ago, making them a lot more likely to be preserved in ro sedimentary rocks. So then the question is, why all of a sudden, 542 million years ago, did invertebrates start to develop shells? Well, it has to do with oxygen concentrations in the ocean and in the atmosphere. By 542 million years ago, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere and the oceans reached modern day levels. And in order for organisms, uh, invertebrates to develop shells or vertebrates to have bones, you need high oxygen concentrations. And so all of these things converged to 542 million years ago. Finally, we had a, a modern you know, oxygen concentrations in the oceans and the atmosphere, allowing for organisms to evolve to develop shells for invertebrates and bones for vertebrates, allowing for them to be preserved in the rock record. So the Cambrian explosion is not really an explosion of life on planet Earth. It's an explosion of preservability. Now, what does a shell do? Or an exoskeleton. Now, exoskeleton means shells and also the carapace for um, arthropods, which means... Uh, think about an ant or a beetle. That hard, it's not really a shell. It's made, uh, that hard substance uh, on the outside of a beetle or an ant or an insect or a lobster. That's called a carapace. So a carapace or a shell shell is considered to be an exoskeleton. Why did organisms, these invertebrates, develop exoskeletons, shells and carapaces? Well, there's an advantage to it. It allows for greater survivability. It provides UV protection from the sun so that organisms will be less likely to get skin cancer and die. UV light can cause cancer. It, think about the advantage that a shell has in keeping moisture inside, allowing for the organism to survive times of drought. When things become dry, you can easily die from drying out. What advantage does a snail have over a slug? A snail can keep its moisture uh, close to it so that it can survive longer, whereas a slug uh, relies on outside moisture and it doesn't have anything to hold the moisture in. If you have a shell, you, you can have a larger body, which also can lead to a higher chance of survival. Also, it provides attachment points for mussels. Think of clams and oysters. These are bivalves, phylum mollusca, they, they have a place to attach their muscles so they can open and close shells to protect themselves. Shells also provide protection against predators. Who's easier to eat, a slug or a snail? A snail is harder to eat. The shell provides protection. Here is this organism that uh, we were talking about from the Burgess Shale called Anomalosiris. There's its mouth. And it's eating another strange creature from the Burgess Shale called Opabinia. O-P-A-B-I-N-I-A. -I -I Look at this strange creature from the Burgess Shale. It has a long tentacled arm. And it has five eyes. One, two, three, five eyes. This arthropod, they're both arthropods. Uh, uh, represents something that does not exist today. Organisms don't no longer have five eyes. They have two eyes. This is a, a, an experiment that Mother Nature tried that didn't work out. And if you don't have what it takes to survive, you die out. That's called extinction. This diagram shows you, uh, and a lot of you, most of you got this right in the lab, but some of you didn't. When you talk about the lifestyle of an organism, you have to know, is the organism benthic 
planktonic, nectonic, or terrestrial. Planktonic organisms float in the water. They're usually very tiny, like those foraminifera. And radiolarians belong to phylum Proterozoa, we talked about earlier on. Nectonic organisms swim. These are your predators, like phylum mollusca, class cephalopoda, fish, whales, seals, anything that swims in the water is nectonic. Your benthic organisms are those that are living on the bottom of the ocean or they dig tunnels in, in, into the bottom of the sea floor. For, so when you get a, a question on the lab quiz, what lifestyle does this fossil did this fossil have? It should be planktonic, benthic, or nectonic, or terrestrial, meaning it lived on the land. First thing I'd like to note is that 95% of the species that are found in the ocean are benthic. 95% of the species found in the ocean are benthic. They live on the bottom of the ocean or they dig tunnels in, into the sea floor. Having said that, 99% of the individual organisms that live in the ocean are planktonic. What does that mean? Well, you may have 95% of the different kinds of species being benthic, but there are huge numbers of these planktonic organisms that belong to the to just a few species. So if you did a census count of every living thing in the ocean, 99% of them would be planktonic. But if you did a count of the spe types of species, the 95% of them are benthic. So you have lots of different benthic species with smaller numbers uh, of populations for each species. And you have a few species that are planktonic, but they have huge numbers of them. Nectonic organisms, even though they only represent 2% of the species in the ocean, are all of your big things, your predators, your fish, your cephalopods, your crustaceans. These are your predators. Let's start talking about invertebrate fossils by talking about the Cambrian, the first period of the Paleozoic. And what you want to remember for the Cambrian is the Cambrian explosion just occurred. So all of your phylum all of those phylum we talked about earlier on, all of these phylum were present in the Cambrian. All of these invertebrate phylum and fish too, which are vertebrates, appeared during the Cambrian. And probably the most common benthic organism of the Cambrian period are the trilobites. These things. Most of you got that right in lab. This is phylum arthropoda, class arthropoda. Phylum arthropoda, class trilobota. I'm sorry. Which in English is called trilobites. Here's the cephalon, the head, the thorax, and the pygidium. It's got a three part body. Here you can see the eyes. And these were, imagine the Cambrian seafloor being covered by thousands and thousands and thousands of these every square mile. They're just covered, the seafloor is covered by these creatures. These creatures, um, phylum arthropoda class trilobota are the same phylum as insects. I insects also belong to phylum arthropoda. Let's take a look at the eyes of these trilobites. Look at their eyes. These are called compound eyes. It's got a lot, these are the same eyes that flies have. Look at all the lenses here on this eye. Never notice how hard it is to, if you take out a fly swatter to kill a fly. It's because the fly can see 
that fly swatter coming from every direction with all of these lenses in its eye, in its compound eyes. Trilobots also had very, could see, since they were benthic, they were on the bottom of the ocean, they crawled along the bottom, they could see in all directions above. And any predator coming, they could see it coming uh, from a long distance and could try and escape. That's one of its defensive mechanisms that trilobites had. Uh, another way that trilobites try to protect themselves is they rolled up into a ball. You ever see those little bugs underneath logs in the back of your house or apartment that roll up into a ball? Um, some people call them roly-poly bugs. Some people call, uh, it depends what part of the country you're from. They call them soil bugs in New Jersey. Some people call them pillbox bugs. But they roll up into a ball to protect themselves. The trilobites would often do that. They would roll up into a ball to protect itself. Another defense mechanism that trilobites had is many of them would have these spikes on their body, especially in the Cambrian, they didn't have spikes, but as the Paleozoic went on, as you go to the later part of the Paleozoic and there were more and more predators, they evolved to protect themselves by developing these spikes. Bottom line is during the Cambrian, the sea floor was covered by trilobites. Please remember that. These benthic creatures were all over the place. The other thing you want to remember about the Cambrian period is the, there were reefs, but instead of the reefs being dominated by corals, phylum synidria, they were dominated by these things. Do you remember what these are again? Archaeocyathids, phylum Archaeocyatha. These are about six foot tall on the average. The reefs were made up of these organisms, and these are only found in Cambrian rocks. So if you find these, these are great index fossils for the Cambrian period. They don't exist in the next period called the Ordovician. Here's your Archaeocyathids, common in the Cambrian. Here's your Burgess Shale. And the next video, we're going to start talking about the Ordovician period and how life, the invertebrate uh, community in the oceans changed. So we'll stop now and uh, look out for the next video.